everybody, it's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. As you guys know, it's free. It's right there. Please hit that subscribe. Please like, please share. Please talk about our contact content and help everyone contact us so we can keep growing and bringing you guys these interviews, man. Now, today, we have the honor and privilege of being joined by not only a rap pioneer, but also one of my good and best friends in the world, B-Love from JVC Force. Thank you for coming through, B-Love. Mr. Baker, good to see your face, man. Thank you for having me. Always, always, man. It's an honor and a privilege, like I said, and you know, B-Love and I go way, way back in the day. So this is a, a great, you know, Zoom has enabled us to do this because, you know, uh, doing this stuff in person is much harder since we live on the other sides of the country. But we are now here. So B-Love is in JVC Force. They've had a phenomenal run in the game and have so much history. So we're going to get to a lot of that and, uh, you know, start this JVC stuff. So B-Love, first of all, one thing that I always thought was interesting and for people to understand is not only what JVC, the acronym stands for, but why you came up with the name and acronym and what it meant and JVC, the electronics company, all these things that are going on. You should explain that right off the top for people to understand. Well, what initially happened was that we named ourselves JVC and that was all. Um, it was justified by virtue of creativity. When we signed the contract with B-Boy Records, after Strong Island, well, right when Strong Island, right before it would come out, uh, and right before it would be pressed, the label received a letter from the Japanese Victory Component Company stating that we couldn't use the name. Um, <clears throat> so at that time, what we figured was, could we put dots in between and still, you know, have the change? That wasn't possible. So Kurt and I, we, we sat down one day in one of our meetings we used to have when we were younger, and we started trying to figure out, it's the force, but what could the force stand for? And then we came with, uh, for obvious reasons concerning entertainment, because music was a part of our lives. That's all we ran to do after school. Even while we were in school, we went on breaks in the cafeteria and stuff, we were beating on tables and rapping. So for justified, <clears throat> justified by virtue of creativity, for obvious reasons concerning entertainment, allowed us to still go ahead and perform as JVC for us and release the song Storm Out without well, a loss. <laughs> yeah, that's important <laughs> to be able to come out. Um, well, you know, hmm? go ahead. Well, you know what, what people didn't realize back then, you know, uh, and still to this day, you know, Japanese victory components, they were a big, big corporation. And, um, you know, there's no way you would have been able to go up against them. So, again, we couldn't, we would never would have been able to operate on just JVC. We had to change it to the force also. Right. So, of course, you're B Love, you're a writer, producer, mastermind of the group, but then you're also joined by AJ Rock and DJ Kirk Kazal. So, explain, you know, you guys are from Long Island, Strong Island, CI, of course. But explain how the three of you guys actually met and became to want to pursue a career in music. Well, you know, the story actually begins, you know, leaving Brooklyn at five years old. Um, coming to Long Island, not knowing anybody at that time, like I say, you know, there were rural blocks with like two or three houses on the block, um, undeveloped area. You know, getting the central isolate, parents buying a house, and then, you know, immediately you have to be enrolled in school. Uh, like I said, my mom and Kurt's mom were both nurses from Brooklyn who migrated out to Long Island, which at the time, like you say, was the final form of living, leaving Brooklyn and moving to the suburbs. So both of us were enrolled at the same school at five years old. I'm actually one year older than Kurt, but we were both enrolled in the same school and we ended up in the same classroom. I at five, him at four. Um, so Kurt is the first person that I had actually met. Um, that was just classroom based. Um, it wasn't the fact our parents didn't know each other or anything at that time. 
AJ came along from being in the neighborhood and being some of the first friendships that I met and the guys I would go around the corner to hang out and stuff with. Um, the music balance came because AJ and I had the most in common. He rapped, he did graffiti, I rapped, I drew, I DJed some. And, and him and I, as the years went by, we began to write the most routines together, do the most harmonizing and things like that together. And, and, and even so, in high school, um, go to perform at the parties. Like if I had to battle somebody, you know, I'd call AJ up and be like, hey, we got a battle. And, you know, we'd literally rehearse every day as JVC waiting for this, you know, again, hoping that we would get a record deal eventually. But at that time, just kind of, and these are the later years with AJ, because there were years that JVC had two female MCs and myself along with Kurt as the DJ prior. But along the years of going with AJ, you know, we practiced our routines, you know, we practiced them and we practiced them. Um, a lot of the routines that ended up on doing Damage album, they were routines that we went over year after year after year in the garage. AJ already knew the lines that I had written that he and how he should say it because they were part of our routines. Um, but the evolution of the whole situation is that we would, we would meet as kids, but in the later years, I would take a back seat from DJing when I met Kirk Cazal to rap. And one of my favorite mentors in the rap game uh, was the, is the Cold Crush Brothers. And to this day, one of my fa is, is my favorite rap group. So my sound, I always wanted my sound when I rapped. Their raps, like, I understood what a DJ would do, but their raps and their ability to just harmonize, I wanted that. And, and when I selected AJ for JVC, initially he was only supposed to be on Strong Island, and that was it. But through the course of time with the amount of material that we had together, we ended up recording the whole Doing Damage album. And eventually it eliminated everything down business-wise to him, Kurt, and I. And we never went into the studio to record a Strong Island. It wasn't the original intent. We were rapping, actually, in the basements, and we were rapping at my house in different places, wherever we could practice at. But like I said, a senior year of high school, when you go on a senior trip, we went to Six Flags as a senior class. And AJ was older, so he wasn't in the high school or anything like that. But a fr another friend of mine who did the human beatbox, we went into one of those recording booths. And what we did was we, I kind of, I did a freestyle, the freestyle called the new school. And I rapped it while he beatboxed because you want to shop a record deal. So you're familiar with how to shop a record deal back then. Now you know where the major labels are and stuff. Middle of the semester in college, get a call from B-Boy Records. They love the new school. They want to have a meeting. I contacted Kurt at that time because, you know, Kurt and I, you know, JVC Force, you know, initially. So we went down to the label. We spoke with them. They told us they wanted to sign that record. And then they asked us, you know, what will we have for a B-side? And that's where the story starts to get, you know, more exciting because AJ, again, he was not at this initial meeting because he wasn't a part of the demo. But it was then selling the fact of AJ being a part of JVC to Kurt. Right. Because again, initially, because again, initially, AJ was just supposed to be on Strong Island, but me and him had so much more together. But it had to be sold. But you know, that's how JVC came together. You know, it's yeah, and I think it's important you had mentioned the Cold Crush because in this era, in the mid '80s and earlier so much of rap especially from the tapes and before rapper's delight which came out in 79 so many of the great groups did harmonize and did these routines 
and you and I have talked about this at length over the years, but, you know, you have a Supreme, like the Treacherous Three and the Cold Crush, just using those two as examples, you have not only the harmonizing, but you have these Supreme lyricists inside the group. So I know that that's been a huge influence for you and, and what you guys did with JVC Force, but for you as a writer and as a producer, with Cold Crush in particular, since they are your favorite, and I know this, what explain how they influenced sonically what you did, and then as a songwriter, what you did? Well, with the Cold Crush, I first heard the Cold Crush Brothers when I was about five years old. Um, a neighbor of mine used to get these cassettes. And I've seen battles before, I've seen battles in the city before, I've heard the Cold Crush, but my, my neighbor used to get these cassettes and let me borrow it for like one night only. And I would have to push two radios together to, to record it. What fascinated me the most about the Cold Crush is how at that time they would take routines um, based on like songs that was out on the radio, like the hottest songs. And they would turn it into their own. And then it was one guy, and then he would pass it over to the next guy, and then the next guy. See, I knew this was possible back then. How much training and technique it would require and how much living with it, which was probably the biggest factor. I listened to these, these, these guys over and over and over and over and over again. Just listening to them to the point to where it became a part of me. Um, I learned all of their routines. I would stand up in the mirror when I was a kid and I would feel like I'm the cold crush and there's this whole crowd around me. And this is what my life was. Every time I turned around and I went into either a battle growing up or having the opportunity to go into a party and rap, I would always make sure as an MC, right, that my impact can move a crowd. You know, one thing that I've learned early on from listening to those guys is that a, a crowd is going to do whatever you are doing, you know, whatever you nav na uh, navigate the crowd to do, whatever you, as long as you can get their participation going, you're going to rock the party. Ever since I was a kid and I, started, I first heard the Cold Crush, the first thing that ever fascinated me about them was their ability to freestyle and their ability to harmonize. Um, they would pass the mic to each other. Um, they would go ahead and harmonize based on some of the hottest music that was out at that time and really turn it into like their own routine. It was very fascinating to me. Um, <clears throat> when I would see them, or I would hear them on a cassette, I could only imagine like how their shows were because at the time I was young, so I wouldn't be able to go into those type of venues and stuff unless it was outside. But I can only imagine how and what they were doing on stage at that time because they had total crowd participation, um, almost like their own movement back then. Um, but again, listening to that stuff, it made me dream about it. Like, Growing up and like loving hip hop from the first time I witnessed it, I dreamt about a lot of the aspects of it. I dreamt about the Cold Crush. I memorized their lyrics. And through the years, as I started rapping and doing my own things and going into parties and, um, you know, battling and freestyling at parties, wherever I can get an opportunity to rap at, I would always make sure that in my mind and that what's coming out of my mouth is almost like the same intensity of the Cold Crush. Um, with AJ, because we were rapping together so much growing up, it just became naturally, for, it became natural for me when he was rapping to know his lyrics and just kind of come in and harmonize with them. And that's, I think, where the initial adaptions of it comes in for us, or for me, I should say, and how it influences us. Because, because they did it, and because it sounded so great. And like I say, 
four or five guys sounding like one. It's spectacular to me. They're doing a better job than most people now going into the studio as a single person. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. A 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It would be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV back Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.